Hello everybody, my name's Liz. I hope that you can all hear me. Um, I've been interested in identifying um, and working with the Kingdom of the Fungi for the last 40 years or so. And during that time, I reckon I've seen a great number of fungi of different shapes and sizes, but of course, actually only a very small percentage of the total diversity, which is estimated to be between one and two million species across our planet. And one thing that I've learned whilst I've been looking at all these fungi is that they rarely look like the pictures in the field guides. Even if you're just focusing on mushrooms and toadstools, which is what I'm planning to do this evening, they can change size and shape and color as they develop. And knowing what are the important and the constant characters to look for is what I want to talk to you about tonight. So before I go into any of that, um, I thought I'd just say a word or two about actually collecting. Fungi are not plants, they are in a very different kingdom. But to give you a comparison with the plants, um, if you collect a mature mushroom or toadstool, it is more like collecting a blackberry or an apple than it is like picking a wildflower. If you do want to learn about these organisms, you've got to get up close and personal. The important characters can only really be seen if you actually carefully collect a fruiting body. When you collect fungi, try and collect them in good condition, and that sounds easy, but sometimes they're naturally very gloopy and slimy, and it can be difficult to tell whether that's what's happened or whether they are actually on their way out. Um, always collect from the very bottom of the stem, or the stipe if you prefer, as there are very important characters there and you need to know whether your collection has them or not. I recommend that when you start, um, you just collect a few fungi so that you don't get overwhelmed when you get back and try and carry them in separate pots or in an open basket. If you've flung them all into a plastic bag, but by the time you get them home, there'll be one horrible soupy mess that you just won't be able to work with. And finally, as far as I'm aware, no one has ever absorbed fungal toxins through the skin. So you can handle them safely and just follow sensible um, procedures as you would when you were out in the woods anywhere and wash your hands before you eat. So a couple of minutes um, actually on fungal um, biology. Um, I think it helps understand and it helps get you to the right place in the book if you know a little bit about how they function because it's important the habitat that you're looking at and also the substrate that your fungi are fruiting in it's important to take that into account when you're trying to identify them so this is what i think most of us think of when we think of our autumn mushrooms and toadstools these lovely umbrella shaped structures but the only purpose of these structures is to produce develop and release fungal spores, which are the fungal equivalent of plant seeds, but a, a great deal smaller. And in a mushroom like this, or a toadstool like this, the, the fertile part of the structure is the gills beneath the cap. And those are the same gills that you get in your shop mushrooms, and uh, it's what's underneath the cap. The rest of the organism, the bit that's feeding and growing and producing these structures, is a network of filamentous cells. They look a bit like this. These are microscopic. They look hollow in this picture, but they're very far from it. This is the functioning part of the organism. And it makes it quite difficult to, uh, to work with fungi because this collection of filamentous cells called a mycelium doesn't always produce a fruiting body. So when we go out, uh, we can't tell um, a, a, a nature reserve or whoever's asked us to look, we can't tell them exactly what's fruiting there. We can only tell them what's fruiting there on the day we visit. So they're quite a difficult group to work with. And of course, the mycelium doesn't help you identify them. You can't identify a mushroom from its mycelium um, without really using DNA. So we're gonna stick with the fruiting structure um, that we, we think of, those umbrella-shaped structures. Now, it is important to understand that fungi don't photosynthesize. This is one of the big differences between fungi and plants. They don't, they're not green, but they don't photosynthesize. They can't get their energy directly from the sun. Um, the sun gives us carbohydrates and sugars, and 
we as animals, we can't get it directly from the sun either. So we get our sunlight energy indirectly. We eat things that plants and vegetables or animals that have eaten plants and vegetables, and we get our sunlight energy that way. So fungi also get their sunlight energy indirectly. Some of them recycle and they will break down already dead plant material, be it litter or, or wood. Um, and a great number of them are um, exchangers and they are living with over 90% of our planet's trees and plants and they exchange. The fungus will give the plant or the tree mineral salts and in exchange the tree will give it some of its photosynthesis, its carbohydrates and sugars. This is really important because you can begin to, to get a picture that a fungus that's growing with a, a birch tree is probably going to be different to the fungus growing with an oak tree. And that's because the fungus and the plant need to know um, that the, uh, its partner is going to actually produce what they want it to. So there's a, there's a lot of chemistry going on there, a real balancing act um, to ensure that the, the exchange can take place. So the sort of habitat that you're looking in is important. As I say, we've got a range of habitats here um, from a wet willow fen to um, an oak uh, wood pasture with very mature oak trees. We've got um, a nice uh, a classic Scottish scene there with um, birch trees and aspen clone. We've got different sorts of conifer trees and a little bit of unimproved grassland. Um, all of those little habitat niches are going to give you different sorts of fungi. And finally, we've got um, a mature pine plantation, um, actually this one on uh, river gravel, so very productive for, for pine associating fungi. So looking at your habitat, looking at what your fungus is growing in, is it growing in soil, in dung, in leaf litter, or on wood? Those are all really, really important things. It can be difficult sometimes to tell whether your fungus is actually growing on buried wood, but at least if, you, if you're aware um, that the, the substrate that the fungus is growing in can give you important clues, um, that will help. Also note whether your fungus was growing by itself, whether it was trooping, lots and lots of them, whether it was tufted, growing from one single growing point, or whether it was growing in a fairy ring. And I always recommend that you take a notebook and pencil out with you when you go um, collecting wild fungi, uh, because it's very easy to forget some of these things. Um, when you, and when you get home, you'll be, you'll be thinking, gosh, where was that fungus growing? Right. So let's think a little bit about the important characters that help you identify your fungus. And I think that um, almost any field guide you, you are looking at will at some point ask you what color the spores are. And as I've said, the spores are the fungal equivalent of plant seeds. In a gilled fungus like this, um, they are just found on the gills themselves. They're on little cells, that tiny microscopic cells that are on the outside of those gills that you can actually see um, here in this, in this image just there. So to get a spore print, you can't shake them out and you can't puff them out. You have to let them drop by themselves. So you can do what I've done here. You can set up your fungus on a piece of cardboard, if you like, um, in a pot like this. Or you can just cut um, the cap off and put it on paper. Now, I am a little bit wary of just using white paper and I've got the white paper on a black bit of plastic here because some fungi give you a white spore print. And if you do your spore print on white paper, you won't be able to see the spore print. Other fungi will give you cream colored spores or rusty red brown spores or dull brown or very dark violaceous black or even pink. Um, so the spore color is really, really important and absolutely fundamental to get you started on identifying your fungus. Um, when you get really picky, you can, um, you can scrape your spores together and flatten them out. And you can see um, this was the spore print. Um, in fact, same as that. It's the same slide. And when you scrape them together, the color is actually darker. But for most of the time when you're just dealing with, when you're starting out with all your fungi, 
just um, a, a simple spore drop like this and it will give you a pattern a bit like the spokes of a wheel. I would suggest that you put a drop of water on the top of the cap once you've cut it off and put it down on your piece of paper. Um, not so that it's falling off the cap, it's just enough to keep it humid and then cover it with um, either a glass or an old jam jar or a, a yogurt pot or whatever, uh, just um, to stop the, uh, to keep it hydrated and to stop the air currents blowing the spores around. And if you leave it for two hours, if your fungus is in good condition, you should get um, enough spores dropped to actually be able to see what color they are on mass. So you'll be looking at hundreds of thousands of spores in your spore drop, quite extraordinary numbers. Don't leave your fungus longer than overnight because um, you will find that the little fungus gnat larvae that will almost certainly have already found their way into the cap um, will be getting into a bit of a panic and they'll be trying to leave their nice um, safe um, home where they've been feeding and yeah your family don't like it when they come into the kitchen and they find little fungus gnat larvae crawling up the wall so don't leave it too long. You shouldn't need to leave it more than two or three hours and it should give you enough spores to know what color they are. This sounds silly, look under the cap. And yeah, a lot of the time, your fungus will have gills like this. But sometimes it will have tubes. And that when you look under the cap to start with, you'll, it looks almost spongy. And if you break or cut down through the fungus, you'll see that um, attached to the, the support, this is sterile support tissue, but hanging down from it are what appear to be hollow tubes. And the spores, the cells bearing the spores are all around the inside of those tubes. So sometimes people send me photographs and they just send it from the top. And I have absolutely no idea whether there are gills or tubes underneath the cap. So have a look. Sometimes they're slot-like structures. And sometimes, like this one, these are little tiny teeth-like structures. They're quite soft to the touch and the spores are on the cells all around the outside of the teeth. But there are some quite commonly found fungi that have these teeth. Um, so always have a good look under the cap. Don't make assumptions. If you have got a gilled fungus, the gills themselves will give you a lot of information. They can be very tightly packed like this one or they can be big and chunky and far apart like that one. Sometimes um, you will see that the very bottom edge of the gill is a different color to the rest of the gills, of the, of the gill face. And it's a really good idea to have a, a hand lens with you and have a look at the gills and, and see, you know, have a look a little bit more closely. You'll also notice that not all of the gills go right across. That one there is just going halfway and some of them don't even go halfway um, and others go all the way across to the stem. This last um, group of, of fungi we call mottle gills and this particular group um, have very dark violaceous black spores and uh, these particular fungi, the, the spores ripen at different times. And so it just gives the face of the gill a rather mottled look. And this is a very common fungus you find in dung or in fields that have had a lot of dung. Um, it's, it's the dung roundhead. And if you, if you do find it, it's got a lovely sticky top, have a look at the gills and you'll see that they're mottled. Um, it's a useful tip and it's very easy to do. Whilst we, before we leave gills, the way the gills attach to the stem is a very important character. Okay, now these, these two fungi, the gills, and so they come from the edge of the cap, as I say, and the ones that go right across, see what they're doing when they reach the stem. Here on this one, you can see there's like a little moat or a gully. And sometimes it's easier to see that structure if you cut down right through um, the fungus. You can see quite clearly that they stop short of the stem. And these are called free gills. There's one common little litter rotting fungus that we find quite regularly. And the gills are actually free, but they're attached to a collar. 
So that's something to look for. Other gills attach, um, this is an adnate gill, and they attach to the stem by the full depth of the gill. This one, which is called adnext, the gills go up towards the cap and they barely touch the stem at all. They are just touching. This one, the gills go across and then they, oops, where's my, there it is. The gills go across, they dink up and then down. And that's emarginate or sinuate. And then lastly, these gills um, are running right down the stem and we call that decurrent. Most of your field guides will have diagrams showing you these gill attachments, so you don't need to worry about trying to remember the names. Something else to um, remember is that they don't always follow the rules that we've, um, we've given them. So, you know, if you're, if you're looking at a fungus and you can't decide whether it's, it's adnate or whether it's um, decurrent, try and, and, and write down what it is you actually see. Sometimes drawing your fungus can really help you focus on the detail. And I usually do recommend that people try sketching. It doesn't have to be a masterpiece, but it just does help you focus on which way the gill is. You know, is, is, it going, is it going up? Is it deeply attached and going up a little bit? Or is it narrowly attached and coming down in a sort of a graceful arch? Okay. Now, the stem. Sometimes there are lovely structures to see on the stem. And this is um, a tubed fungus, a bolete. And you can see it's got these lovely network um, called a reticulation. And this is particularly on our boletes, and they can be different colors. This one is a red reticulum, um, but you can have um, a white reticulum and other colors, yellow reticulum as well. So look out for that. Um, this one is another bolete, and here the stem is covered in these lovely little fluffy scabbers. So that's something to look for. If you've got a bolete and it's covered in fluffy scabbers like this, little scales, little bundles of cells, that puts you straight into a genus called Leximum, and it's as easy as that. Other fungi sometimes have um, nicely coloured fibres on the stem. Just sometimes um, there are fibres that actually catch the spores as they're, as they're falling. And you can sometimes tell what colour the spores are by looking at the top of the stem. But some fungi just have these wonderful coloured fibres and they're useful to, to look out for. And you can see here as well that the base of the stem is swollen. And that will be an important character. Just as on this one, it's actually it's swollen just like a little onion on the bottom. And this is a, something called an inosopy, and if you were to collect that without the base, you could probably get as far as inosopy, but you would never get further than that, because one of the early questions is going to be, or one of the important characters is going to be, does it have a bulb at the bottom of the stem? And if you've not got the bottom of the stem, you're never going to know. Occasionally, fungi have these little resting structures. They look like little lentils. And it is a bit like um, a corm, it's called um, a sclerotia, or many sclerotia, one sclerotium. And it is, um, it's a, a resting structure that the fungus will grow from the next year. Not all fungi have that, so if you find a fungus with it, it can um, help with your identification. Sometimes fungi have lovely colours at the base. This has got beautiful ginger hairs at the very base of the stem. And sometimes you'll notice a little tiny primordia. This is um, this is uh, um, this little chap probably won't develop um, if the main fungus reaches maturity. And you will hear people say that you must cut your fungus because if you cut it, it'll grow again. That's often well. That isn't what happens. The original, the cut fungus, doesn't grow again, but it does sometimes stimulate the primordium um, to grow. Okay, um, indirectly, um, still with stems, another really important set of characters are what we call veils and rings, cortinas and bulbas. Now, 
I said that the fertile part of our um, gilled fungi and our tube and, and um, tooth fungi is under the cap. The cap is protecting it from too much water. It's keeping um, all the spores nice and hydrated. And it's also giving some it's support, basically, um, for the spores. The stipe holds that fertile area up into the air current. So as the spores mature and drop out, they're wafted away on the breeze. Some fungi take the whole looking after the development of the spores a lot more seriously. And they have um, they develop something which we call a veil. And there are two main sorts of veil. Um, in this case, this is a membranous veil, and we call this a partial veil. And it goes from the edge of the cap across to the stem. And it, it's intact whilst the spores are maturing. But as that cap expands, as the spores mature, that veil ruptures around the edge of the cap and flops back onto the stem like a little skirt. And we call this a ring. And in this particular fungus, and the next fungus, this one, it forms a real ring-like structure, and it's very, very obvious on the stem. Occasionally, they will wear off or, or be eaten off. Um, and so uh, sometimes, if you collect a young specimen as well as a mature specimen, it's quite a lot easier to see whether or not your fungus had a veil. Sometimes the veil is gelatinous, and I don't know if you can see, but on the underside of this bolete, there's a gelatinous and it's lemon yellow veil. And when that ruptures, you can see little bits around the edge left behind and this kind of sticky ring zone on the stem. So that was also a partial veil. More difficult to see, but equally important to know whether your fungus has it, um, sometimes the fungus produces really what is effectively a cobwebby veil. And it's difficult to see. It maybe looks membranous in these photographs. Um, but these are actually little tiny um, rem uh, cobwebby sort of fibers. And of course, with them being quite thin and fibery, when the cap expands, they break and they just form a very sort of indistinct ring of fibers on the stem. So the best way to know whether your fungus had this cobwebby veil, which we call a cortina, um, is to collect um, one young specimen and have a look at that closely. So the second sort of veil, um, we've done, they were all partial veils, but the second sort of veil goes from the very base of the stem. And when the fungus is young, it completely encloses the whole fruiting structure. And we call this a universal veil. And our favorite um, fairy tale fungus, the fly agaric or Amanita muscaria, um, has a universal veil that completely enclosed it. And as the fungus grows up and out, that veil breaks up and it leaves little tiny remnants on the cap, little white spots. And it also leaves white dots around the base of the stem. You'll notice that this fungus had a, a partial veil as well. It's got a ring, as well as the remains of the universal veil, which at the base of the stem we call a vulva. And then we just call them spots on the cap. So this is the same fungus, just looking sideways. And whoops, oops. Um, you can see that it's got concentric bands of that universal veil left behind at the base of the stem. Now, other fungi have universal veils that are not quite as friable, and they produce these lovely um, sac-like structures at the bottom of the stem. And I, I hope that you're beginning to see why it's so important to collect the base of the stem. Because knowing whether your fungus had um, a universal veil, a vulva like this, and particularly like this one, can make all the difference between um, somebody collecting um, uh, this fungus called um, the, de uh, the uh, Amanita phylloides. Um, and the, it, it has a close relative called the destroying angel Amanita virosa, which is completely white. And people do mistake that white destroying angel for field mushrooms. 
very easy to do, but the combination of the vulva and the color of the spores should mean that you never make a mistake like that. So moving away from veils and from stipes, just to look at the cap itself in a bit more detail. Some caps um, have these lovely scales. Um, they are, those particular ones are scattered all over the, the cap surface. Here they're a little bit more concentrically arranged. And these are actually not the remains of a universal veil. They're actually integral to the cap itself. Some caps um, are, have a sort of a, an arrangement of radial fibers and they quite often split um, like along really the, the radial fibers. So that can be a, a helpful identification feature. And occasionally the, the superficial cover of the cap um, will actually pull back from the edge of the cap and leave a little bare bit there. So there's lots of things to look for. Um, here's um, another character which you might not automatically consider um, when you're collecting your fungi. I've spoken about them um, changing um, shape and size as they develop and grow, but some of them also change color. When I collected this fungus first, it was completely white, but everywhere I've touched it, it's gone yellow and um, that's, that is a common color change, particularly in agaricus agaricus species, the, the field mushroom type species. This is another common color change. If you bruise the mushroom, it goes this kind of pink color and then that will eventually turn dark gray black. A lot of our boletes blues, bruise blue and you can see these are just thumbprints on the underneath that the, the um, opening, the pores, the opening of the tubes were yellow and where they've been bruised, they've turned blue. Other fungi change color because they're drying out. And again, um, your notebook can be very useful until you really get confident with your fungi. Um, just to, or a, a camera, of course, these days, taking photographs of what you collect as they're fresh in the field. Because sometimes they dry. You can see that the center here is a different color from the outside. And you can lose characters um, just as they dry. And in fact, you get it back and you don't even remember collecting it because it doesn't look anything like it did when you first collected it. Um, can't resist putting that picture in because this is one of our, um, not a common bowly, but it is out there. And when you first see it, it is just all creamy white. And the minute you touch it, the second you touch it, it goes cornflower blue. And when you cut it down through, like that, it just goes an extraordinary cornflower blue. Other um, boletes go other shades of blue, but that one is particularly wonderful. That's Gyroporus cyanatin, the cornflower bolete. When you start as well, when you've got a, your little mushroom, it's always worth breaking a little bit of the flesh. Um, if it's a fairly robust fungus, you know, like this, um, and it's producing a milk-like um, substance, a latex, um, that almost certainly puts you straight into the genus um, Lactarius, or one of the milk caps. And the milk and the color of the milk um, can help you identify which one. So the milk can be pink, or it can be bright yellow. Sometimes there's one or two that go green. And sometimes they start white, but they change and they go gray um, or they go um, yellow as they get older. Oh, and there's one that's absolutely um, lilac. It's a wonderful thing. So milk caps, quite easy to do, really. And you'll see there's no veils of any kind on the stipe of that one. And it would give you a pale cream or white spore print. So combinations of characters are really important and help you identify. And then lastly, I'm going to leave you with um, um, a, a, a character which is difficult for some people. It's the smell. And if you, if you sniff under the cap, you'll be amazed. Not all fungi, some just smell of, of mushroom, but some smell of coconut, others of um, curry or aniseed. Um, this particular fungus, well, was it a nice smell? Yeah, it was, but almost impossible to put a name to it. it it's, it's an extraordinary 
aromatic smell, and I have cheated with this fungus because we were in Sweden when this was collected. It's Tricholoma matsutaki, um, and the smell is quite extraordinary. Um, a wonderful, um, a wonderful smell. And I know that not everybody can um, use their sense of smell. My husband can never smell them at all. He says they all smell like old towels. Um, so you can't rely on it. But if you do have a good nose, it's always worth having a sniff. So as I say, these combinations of characters should help to get you to the right part of the book. So your spore color, your gill attachment, what's happening on the stem, has it got a veil? Um, has it got um, a partial veil or a, a, a universal veil or doesn't it have a veil at all? All these things and combinations of those things should help you um, start with your identifications. So thank you very much for listening tonight. I hope that it's been helpful. I'd also like to thank the Field Studies Council and the British Mycological Society for making um, this presentation possible. Um, and I think perhaps it's over to you now. If you've got any questions, I'll do my best to answer them. That was brilliant. Thank you very much, Liz. We've got lots of questions in the chat box already. So I think I'll jump in. Uh, our first question was from Katie, who was asking, can you obtain spores whilst you're out in the field without needing to take any specimens? Could you put paper under them whilst you're in the field? Would that work or not? Um, it would be more difficult, I think, to do that in the field. Uh, well, if you put, pe you could possibly, how could you do it? Uh, you'd have to set something up. You'd have to hope it wasn't raining if you were wanting to use paper. Um, you could possibly, um, I don't know. It would be very difficult to do. And you would also have the problem of the wind moving them around. But sometimes if you've got, uh, some fungi grow in clusters. And if you look underneath at the fungus underneath, you will see that it's dropped a spore print on the cap of the fungus underneath the gills. And as I mentioned also, sometimes the spores will collect at the top of the stem, especially if there's a cobwebby veil, they will collect on that. Well, thank you. Uh, David Howden, you've got your hand up. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, thanks, Liz. That was, that was fascinating. Uh, really, really interesting. Um, so, thought, is there any practical way to preserve fungi specimens a bit longer so that you know if you need to show them to someone who knows what they're doing you can hang on to them yes yeah you can um uh you can dry them if you dry them very gently um, and make sure they're absolutely crispy dry all the microscopic characters will be intact and that's what most people would need um to really get to species uh, what you would ideally need to do before you did that was take a spore print and or you can if you do that on paper the spores will stay once they're dry they will they will last for decades um, so spore print and also record anything like smells textures things that you'll lose when you dry them but yep drying fungi preserves the microscopic characters perfectly thanks well thank you we've got another question about spore prints here from rachel she was asking, do they set spores as soon as they open or is it best to wait until they're a bit more mature? Um, well, they open and then they grow a bit more. So you need something that's fully mature. They, they will start dropping spores once they've started to open out. Um, but obviously, the more mature they are, the, you, know, the, you have to catch them before they start going over because once they've gone over, obviously, you know, they don't drop spores then. So you've got a few days, I would say. And most of our um, short-lived fungi will probably be there, assuming they're not eaten by slugs and things, um, be there for about a week. So I would think sort of, you know, three days in would probably be a good time to do it. But I think mostly if you've got a decent umbrella-shaped cap, it will drop your spores. Great, thank you. Um, Elvis Benson, you've got your hand up. Do you want to ask your question? Uh, hello there. I was just wondering uh, what books are good uh, for beginners to understand um, mushrooms on a microscopic level because um, I just wanted to start studying them under a microscope but I don't know what books to go for really. Oh gosh, right. That's more difficult. Um, I would recommend that you, rather than just going for a book, that you, you perhaps try and find a local recording group because 
um, most recording groups will do microscope workshops and that is definitely the very best way to get to know. Um, there is a book that's out of print, which isn't a lot of help. Actually, if you go onto the, um, the Scottish uh, mycological site, um, there's a very good introduction to microscopy on there. Uh, what's it called? Okay. I should know that. Um, gosh, I should know that. Scot Scottish mycology, I think. If you if you look for Scottish mycology or Scottish field mycology, um, I'll Google that online. Um, you will find an introduction to microscopy that you will find helpful, but it's okay, not a book. It's online. Yeah, anything would help. So yeah. thank you. Well, thank you. And um, following on from that as well, we've got lots of people asking, what field guides do you recommend for beginners? Um. Gosh, there are so many out there now. Uh, the Roger Phillips um, field guide, the mushrooms of Britain, um, is, is as good as any. Um, it's a little bit big to take out into the field. Uh, Jeffrey Kibbe's just produced two out of, that will be three volumes, and they're beautifully illustrated. They're really nice field guides. Any of the Collins field guides, um, they're, all, they're all good. None of them are comprehensive. They can't be. Uh, because you can't put all the detail in there. There's, there's so many fungi. But to get you started, um, any good field guide with, with good illustrations um, will, will, will help you. And as I said, Roger Phillips, I started with Roger Phillips, and I found it very helpful. Most field guides will have a good introduction. Um, but yeah, I hope that helps. There's so many, uh, you know, to actually um, give you... I could go and get my box of them and have it take all evening. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, we've got a few questions as well asking, um, you've shown those photos before when you touched it in that amazing cornflower blue, I can't remember the name of the species, sorry, but what, what is the reaction that caused that? Is it oxidation? Or? It's an oxidation of pigments, yeah. We've no idea why they do it. There's no obvious reason why they do it. Um, it is just part of, I mean, they're incredible chemists, fungi, they have to be because they're kind of working with the plant kingdom, which are also incredible chemists. So the two chemistries have to get along. And yeah, so chemistry is an integral part of fungal biology, really. Uh, it's, it helps them function. So yeah, maybe one day someone will tell us. We, we once asked why wax cats were such beautiful colours. They're pink and red and orange and yellow and green and goodness knows what else. And we asked... Um, a leading expert and he pretended he hadn't heard because he didn't know the answer. They don't rely on insect fertilization so we don't even know why they're such beautiful colours, any of them really. That's fascinating, thank you. Uh, we've got a question from someone called N which is asking, do bigger specimens produce higher quality spores than smaller ones? Uh, do you mean um, more mature so if you collect an immature um maybe so no. yeah. but no small fungi will produce just as good a spore print as big fungi little tiny fungi that um as the cap is maybe half a centimeter across you can get a perfectly good spore print from that if you do it carefully so no it, it doesn't make any difference really i mean obviously if you've got a massive fungus it probably will produce more spores um but it, it, you will still get spore prints. Doesn't really matter what size they are as long as they're mature. Great, thank you. Um, Rachel was asking about collecting specimens. Um, she's seen on some, I think it's on some Facebook groups, um, that sometimes people get a bit upset if you're picking them, saying it might damage the fungi. What's the sort of, what's well, the on that? What are you supposed to do? I mean, I, I, as I said earlier, if you want to really get up close and personal with your fungi, you do have to collect them. I would not suggest to anybody that they go out there and collect wholesale. It's, you're removing an important food source from the environment uh, for insects and for mammals at this time of the year. Um, but you're not actually damaging the organism. And by the time they have opened out, they've already really achieve what they set out to do, which is to release spores into the atmosphere. Um, you, you can pick or you can, um, sorry, you can cut or you can um, gently 
you know, lift the whole thing. People have looked at whether it affects the organism, how you collect them, and it, it doesn't make any difference. Um, they also did an experiment in Europe where um, they, they ha had an area of woodland and they had a control bit where they did nothing. They had another bit where they picked everything that fruited. And then they had another bit where they trampled up and down. And uh, where they picked, they picked from um, like a raised board so that they weren't actually trampling. And what they found was that where they picked, they just continued to fruit. It didn't seem to make any difference. The thing that made a difference was trampling. And um, they think probably that that is destroying the, the primordium, the, the immature fruiting body, or it might be compacting the mycelium. We don't know for sure. Um, and it, I think it's a big problem where there are lots and lots of people going out and collecting lots and lots of fungi um, for the pot, as it were. And I'm certainly not recommending that we all go out and do that. What I'm suggesting is that if you want to get to know a bit more about your fungi and learn about them, then you do have to collect them carefully. Don't strip the whole lot out. Only take a few home that you think you can deal with. And if you do it carefully, um, you are not going to damage the organism. The mycelium will be fine without its fungus, without its fruiting body. So some of them don't produce fruiting bodies for 20 years or so. They're still there functioning. They're just not fruiting. Okay, thank you. Um, Martha was asking, are there any particular groups or genus that are more common or distinctive that you would suggest for beginners to use as sort of a starting point for getting into identification? Bolete's a knife, uh, the ones with tubes under the cap. Um, they're quite often more doable than the agarics. There's so many agarics, so many different ones, and so many that look very similar to each other. Um, Amanita is a very, and that's a guild um, fungus. And it does contain some of our very poisonous fungi, but it is also largely reliant on macro characters to identify it to species and they are nice big fungi with nice characters so yeah that you can use them and similarly tricholoma or lactarius that's another nice group with the milk uh, lactarius species because you've got the milk you know your where you are with them and and again often you can get a very long way with just macroscopic characters great thank you and then We've got a few questions about harmful species as well. Are there any particular distinctive characteristics of any sort of toxic species to look out for? No, <laughs> you just have to know your fungus. Um, they, there are white spored toxic ones, there are uh, black, you know, dark spored, brown spored toxic ones, pink spored toxic ones. Um, it's co all about combinations of characters. So know what your spore color is, know whether it's got veils or not and what the gills are doing. Um, you really just have to know your fungi. There's no, there's no way, no way that you can say that particular thing means it's poisonous. Great, thank you. Um, Chloe was asking, she's seen on um, videos on YouTube recommending to flick caps presumably to help release the spores. Do you recommend that? Is that something you've heard of before? Um, no, I mean, when I collect, if I, if I am teaching and I collect a fungus that I don't want to take back, I've, I've collected it to show people something, I will always put it back the right way up. I hate seeing fungi just tossed on the floor. Um, I always, because it will continue releasing spores as long as, you know, the, the, the gills are geotropic. So as long as your fungus is, is you know, the gills are perpendicular, uh, that will continue to drop spores successfully. Um, but I don't think flicking helps. Um, people say if you collect in a basket, well, yes, that's true. If you collect in a basket, an open basket, the spores will be blowing about. But um, there are so many spores out there anyway. Uh, I don't think, you can't really flick them off. Sometimes with an ascomycete, that's a different, we haven't talked about those at all. They're spore shooters where the spores are pressurized, they're not relying on gravity. Sometimes you can make them puff by actually holding your hand over the cup and you know it just changes the humidity of the cup and you'll see a little puff of spores where they've all been shot out. Puff balls, if you, uh, they're designed to be kicked if you like, 
um, or usually by passing animals, but small children seem to do a particularly good job as well. There's nothing quite like jumping on a puffball um, <laughs> to have loads of fun. And that's just releasing the spores. Um, so yes, in that instance, where your fungus is specifically designed to be um, uh, to be kicked to release the spores. In, in other words, it needs a physical disturbance. But most fungi rely, most agarics, most mushrooms and toadstools rely on gravity. So they will drop when they're good and ready. Thank you. We had a question from Lauren. She's asking, why do uh, species like toadstools uh, fly agaric? Why, why are their caps sometimes round and sometimes they're flat when you see them? They sort of curve upward sometimes as well. What causes that? My favourite word is, is developmental and it's all to do with um, what's going on around them, what, what the weather's been doing, has it been wet? Um, I, you know, obviously the cap will start out curved in because it's protecting that fertile surface. So even if it hasn't got a veil, the cap will initially be quite enrolled to to maintain the humidity and to, to try and keep grazing organisms away from the fertile structure and obviously then it wants to open out so the spores can re be released uh, so it's all about how it develops and that can mean uh, you know something that looks incredibly characteristic like a wonderful sort of curved up edge to your fungus actually isn't that's not an important character at all it is simply how it's developed Great, thank you. Um, Terry was asking, which is the best habitat for fungal species and which is the poorest habitat? Fungi underpin every habitat on our planet. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that you go into the desert um, or to the, um, the ice caps uh, to look for fungi because you won't find them particularly, um, but they'll be there functioning Equally, you could go into an ash, sycamore, elm, woodland, and you would not find um, the big showy um, exchanger fungi growing with those trees, because they do have exchanger fungi growing on their roots, but the, the whole life cycle of those particular fungi is within the soil. So if you're in an ash, sycamore, elm kind of woodland, you will find recycler fungi, but you won't find the big fruiting bodies of, of symbiotic exchanger fungi. But any um, uh, conifers, birch, oak, anything, particularly on poor soils where they really need their fungal partner um, to get um, nutrients, you will find um, lots and lots of fungi. Um, where else? I mean, you can find them in sand dunes growing with um, marum grass and on a good fruiting day, uh, there'll be lots of fungi growing on the sand dunes. So they are, they are everywhere. Grasslands, grasslands, uh, improved grasslands, no. Um, if you've got lots of MPK, uh, artificial or farmyard fertilizer on your field, you might get a few um, dung loving species but you won't get um, your lovely collections of wax cat fungi. They need unimproved grasslands, short sword. So yeah, there are, um, yeah, there are some habitats that probably won't produce as much for people to look at and enjoy and identify as others, but the fungi will be there. It's just not necessarily visible. Yeah, thank you. Um, oh, sorry, a few questions just come in. It's shot off the screen for me. Um, Jenny is asking, is it necessary for any species to look at them at different stages of development to obtain an accurate identification? Yes, uh, certainly I would all, when you start, when you're first starting out, I, I suggest that you try and collect a very young specimen because um, I was explaining about the partial veils are sometimes cobwebby and that can be very difficult to be sure about on a mature specimen. Once that cobwebby veil is broken, you just get left with little fibers and sometimes they rub off. Um, so obviously, yes, you need to be careful about handling your fungus when you're collecting it. Um, but if you have a very young, one young specimen, you can usually see more easily whether or not it's got that cobwebby veil. So it is, it is useful to have different stages when you first start looking at fungi. Great, thank you. Uh, we've got a question from Louise asking, uh, can spores be dangerous if accidentally inhaled, like when you were talking about kicking puffballs before? Um, 
I, I know that some people are um, allergic or have allergic reactions to mold spores when they are living in damp um, accommodation, that, that can be an issue. Um, generally speaking, we're designed to cope with spores because um, the air is full of fungal spores. Um, they're all around us all the time. So, you know, we have, our body has systems to deal with spores unless your immune system is compromised. And obviously then that's a different situation and fungi can then be quite dangerous to the human body. But um, I've been sniffing and um, kicking, no, I haven't been kicking puffballs, but I have been puffing puffballs and sniffing fungi for 40 odd years now. And it's such wood, never done me any harm. Great, thank you. Right, I will think we'll end it there. I know there's a couple of questions in the chat. People are asking about uh, trees and fungi, but we have a talk on that tomorrow. And if you're not coming along, the recording will be uploaded to YouTube afterwards. So hopefully that will answer your questions for you. Um,